excited that you guys are coming in today um, at this moment in time because applications and deadlines for these internships are closing uh, very soon. So we're happy that, to have you here today and we're gonna give you a lot of information. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So a little bit of an explanation as to why we're doing this panel. Um, so um, research experiences during the summer are incredible ways of getting your feet wet um, with um, just experience in research. If you haven't been able to get involved in research yet at your university, whether it be Cornell or otherwise, um, a little bit of the history of these kinds of programs. So in the mid or late 1950s, um, the National Science Foundation or NSF, this is a, an organization that you're going to hear a lot about when you get into research, um, they started this, this concept of the research experiences for undergraduates or RUs. Um, these experiences were typically uh, hosted by university institutions, um, but now uh, other universities um, and research institutions um, have sort of taken this concept and run with it. So uh, these experiences are not just eight to 10 weeks of research. A lot of the time uh, they involve potentially doing some shadowing in clinics or um, other professional development opportunities, mentoring. Um, so they sort of ran with the idea and made it their own. So um, it's a very exciting time to get into these opportunities. And I think through hearing from our panelists, um, you'll be able to hear our genuine experiences and hopefully first be inspired to apply this this year uh, for next summer. Um, and also to, to understand sort of why it's really useful to participate in these experiences and what you can get out of it. Um, and we'll be here for questions. So do, do not be shy. We're all students here. Um, please ask your questions um, and get your questions answered. Um, so thank you for being here and um, hopefully you learn a lot from this panel. So a little bit of, a, of an introduction from all of our panelists. Um, we'll be saying a little bit about who we are um, and the experiences that we, uh, that we completed. So Andrea first. Yes, yeah, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, if you hear something in the background, sorry, it's my dog. But my name is Andrea Lucia Alfonso, and I'm coming from uh, coming to you from New Jersey. This is where uh, my hometown is. But I was originally born in Bogota, Colombia, and I came when I was very young. Uh, so I actually just graduated from Cornell, and I studied biological engineering in the College of Engineering. So I was a December graduate. Uh, but um, the research that I did at Cornell, I did get to do it over one summer, but this was more of an academic year thing. And I was in the butcher lab in the biomedical engineering department. And there I was basically focusing on the effects of mechanical stimulation on cardiomyocyte maturation and basically cardiovascular tissue engineering if someone is not uh, completely uh, in the field. But um, in terms of the experiences that I've had myself, so the first program you see on top, which the deadline is February 1st, so feel free to apply. And um, all of, there's hyperlinks for everyone's slides for the actual program. So if you click on the actual slides when you get them, it'll direct you uh, straight to the website. But basically the first uh, program that I had was um, an in-person program, but I also wanted to note that my experience last summer, although the deadline has already passed, it was a remote experience. So if you're having, um, difficulties on deciding of if you should apply to research, even if it's gonna be remote, please do. It was an amazing experience and it, I got so much out of it and so much more than I really didn't think I would. So I can talk a lot more of that in a little bit, but please do not hesitate to apply. And then in terms of what I'm doing after grad, um, right now I'm working at a clinic and I'm hoping to apply to MD, PhD programs. Uh, and I'll be going to the NIH in May to start an NIH post back position. Um, excellent. So I can also give an introduction. Um, I just wanted to double check though, were you all set with your slides? 
Yeah. Okay, good. Um, sorry, I got like forced muted at the beginning, so I wanted to make sure that I wasn't cutting anyone off. But hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Joanna Papadakis. It's great to be speaking with you all today. I saw a few familiar faces, so that was exciting as well. Um, but to give you a broad overview of sort of what I do at Cornell, I'm a senior, which is crazy to think about, um, studying human development, and I have minors in global health and biology. And um, at Cornell, I've currently been working on two active projects, one which is, I guess you would call maybe more traditional and something that I am also did this past summer and have done in prior summers. Um, and that's working with the Canfield Lab for Global Nutrition. Um, I absolutely love working in this lab. It looks at um, severe acute malnutrition in infant populations in Malawi, both from the biochemical side and then also specifically looking at the potential for cognitive outcomes and developmental, developmental outcomes in infants. And so it's really a conglomeration of all the things that I care a lot about. Um, so it's been a super wonderful experience and happy to talk more about how I got that um, later on in this presentation because it involved like a lot of reaching out while at Cornell and thinking about what I wanted to do in research. Um, and then I'm also currently still working on um, the emergency preparedness team, which is, I guess you could call maybe a less formal lab position, um, but still a research position and something that's through Cornell that I took on this past summer. But it's a collaboration project between the Tompkins County of Public Health and also the Cornell MPH program. We work under the PI, Dr. Elizabeth Fox, who does um, international epidemiology work um, in community food systems. But our particular project is actually developing and drafting um, emergency preparedness planning tools for Tompkins County, um, mostly to reflect what's currently happening with the pandemic and then also to consider the possibility of future sort of mass emergency instances and how we would respond as a county. So it's been really cool um, opportunity. That was sort of more of a formal application process that I went through this past summer with the Cornell Global Health um, minor team, which is part of our ELO requirements. So if you are getting the minor, interested in getting the minor, you have to do sort of this engaged learning opportunity. And so this was what I did for that. Um, it was also a remote opportunity and I think that I was definitely apprehensive about remote opportunities to um, do a project over this past summer but I got so much out of it and I still continue to get so much out of it and so it's really recontextualized what I think uh, remote work looks like and how valuable it truly can be to kind of echo um, I'm sure everything that all of the panelists are going to share throughout this um, and then I've also worked um, at the DECO laboratory which is more of another formal process um, that was at Massachusetts General Hospital, which you can kind of see this picture here. It's a phenomenal hospital in Boston um, and a leading research institution. And so I was working in maternal psychiatry on developing um, and also analyzing possible prevention and treatment for maternal uh, PTSD following childbirth. And so I've been writing this review the entire summer and then also a bit into the fall in terms of the drafting and submitting process, which if you're in research or considering research, it's something you're gonna do. Um, it's a lot of fun, but can definitely be sort of a prolonged process. Um, but it was a great opportunity. It was another remote op opportunity I had this past summer, and it was great to get exposure to sort of more of the clinical side of research. I highly recommend supplementing any research you do at Cornell with clinical research if you are at all interested in pursuing medical school in the future or MD, PhD tracks. Um, and then the last thing that I put on this is something that I can talk a bit more about when we talk about like grant writing and finding funding. But this uh, final opportunity was technically not a research opportunity, so I won't like dive too much into what it actually involved. But I put it on here because it was a super formative pre-health opportunity and how I got funding for it was turning this opportunity, which wasn't a research opportunity, into more of an individualized research opportunity. So I actually conducted sort of supplemental research for this project in order to secure funding for it so that I didn't have to pay anything. Um, so that was really great. Uh, and it was, again, looking more like emergency medicine and rural health and preparedness, which is sort of a theme throughout all of my research opportunities. But happy to talk more about how to get Cornell to provide funding and to pay for things that you want to do um, and how to kind of include research in all of that. Um, but that was kind of a lot. I, I will definitely dive more into sort of the specifics on how I got these opportunities later, but to sort of provide a general overview about what I hope to do in the future. 
after I graduate this spring is to take two years as a gap year before medical school. And I definitely want to continue doing research. I'm currently applying for clinical research opportunities. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that process as well and how to navigate that and how to be successful. But I definitely think that all of the things that Cornell can give you in this particular program is super valuable. So very happy you're all here to learn more about it. Hi everyone, um, my name is Emily. I'm also a senior. Um, I'm double majoring in psychology and music and minoring in cognitive science and probably human development. Um, haven't officially declared that yet. Um, I am zooming in from near Boston and so at Cornell, I mainly do research in music cognition, music psychology, um, in two different labs. So I'm, uh, my main lab, which I'm doing my senior thesis in, is the uh, music cognition lab with Carol Krimhansel. And for that, I'm doing a project on um, how the pandemic has impacted how we listen to music. And I'm also in the Sternberg lab, which is in the HD department. And on that, um, I'm doing a project, or I'm helping on a project, about um, why people quit musical instruction um, and if we can like connect the triangular theory of love which is uh, intimacy passion and um, commitment to um, to like why people quit musical in um, instruction i also do um, research for tcat which is not related to music cognition at all um, but it's yeah that's been a good time and basically um, trying to help them remodel the uh, transportation system in Tompkins County. Um, so I've done like three programs that were pretty different. Um, and well, the first one was I was just working in a lab. It was kind of not a program, but more of um, a, like a formal research assistantship. And that was at Harvard in 2018. Um, and then um, in summer 2019, I did the Center for Visual Science Summer Fellowship at University of Rochester, where I was working in a lab. Uh, I was going to weekly meetings um, we, with the other students in the program, um, and kind of just, um, we went to a conference, so that was fun. Um, we had like a lot of opportunities to network with each other and presented our projects at the end of the semester. And then this past summer, I did the NYU Psychology Virtual Research Internship, um, which was a week-long program. I know they have it in non-pandemic times too. Um, I'm not sure uh, what it's like in person, but online at least, um, we were given a mentor and um, they were either a postdoc or a um, graduate student and they helped us go through our CV or resume. And we also developed a brief research project with a group and learned some coding skills in R. Um, yeah, so I guess my long term goal, um, I'm currently interviewing for PhD positions in psychology and neuroscience. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Phil Martinez. I'm also a senior. Um, I'm a biology major with a concentration in neurobiology and behavior, minors in business and uh, gerontology. Um, and I'm from Westview, New Jersey. I just got up to Ithaca today, so I'm up here now. And uh, so at Cornell, my research um, that I do is uh, kind of pertains to false memory. It's the Memory Neuroscience Research Lab with Dr. Charles Brainerd. I'm currently doing a senior thesis on phonological and semantic false memory, which is just kind of fancy, fancy terms for different components of your memory. And uh, the uh, kind of main formal research experience I had was during the summer of 2019, and then I had more so an informal research experience um, the next summer through connections uh, with my previous internship. So my formal one was with the Translational Research Institute in Pain and Later Life. Uh, that was at Weiler Cornell. It was an eight-week internship in person. There were three other interns, and our main kind of goals or studies uh, pertain to geriatrics, it was clinical research. The main thing we looked at patients' pain management goals. So people who are in chronic pain, we were asking them, what are your goals? Do you want to limit your pain? Do you want to limit the side effects um, of your medication? Uh, kind of aiming towards having better patient-centered care. I had recruited other adults in senior centers and um, community, um, other community centers and geriatric practices. 
Uh, I did some interview coding and made a database as well for other studies um, pertaining to geriatrics. I got the shadow a out of care team, um, pediatricians and, and, uh, and uh, elder abuse meeting as well. And I also got the sit in on geriatric and palliative medicine um, meetings. That was the, the floor that I was working on. And kind of through that, then I had um, a more so informal internship working with another PI who's affiliated with Triple. Uh, and I did that during the summer, during last summer, I guess. And that was about extreme events in COVID 19 and the effects uh, kind of holistically on older adults uh, in New York City. And I guess for my. Um, future career goals I'll be um, going to as it currently stands I'll be going to Johns Hopkins School of Medicine next year but we shall see and um, and yeah that's kind of everything. Congrats Phil. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> so hi everyone I'm Mika. I'm also a December 2020 graduate so I just graduated which is makes me very nostalgic and very sad, but I'm excited to move on to the next stage. Um, I, it, when I was at Cornell, I majored in biological sciences, concentrating in genetics, genomics, and development. Um, and I also did a lot of computer science, so I say that I'm sort of double concentrated in, in genetics and computational biology. Um, and I'm zooming in from DC, uh, Washington DC, where a lot of things are happening right now. Um, my research lab at Cornell, I worked there for two years. Um, I was in Mariana Wolfner's lab in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics. Uh, we were doing reproductive genetics work, um, specifically on post-mating behaviors in fruit flies. So um, did a lot of work with these creatures um, and it was very exciting. I did my senior thesis there um, and I was working on my senior thesis project, as well as some other smaller projects uh, using computational tools. Um, a little bit of an overview of the summer programs that I completed. So um, after my freshman year, I was at the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, uh, in, the, in the Department of Bioethics, um, it, completing this, their summer internship program, or SIP. Um, their deadline is February 1st, so highly recommend that you apply if you're interested in in getting to know the NIH as, as a research institution. Um, and this is mostly clinical research, but they also do basic science, um, translational research, um, so uh, across the board. So a great place to get involved in, and meet people. Um, there, I was working on a project on consenting individuals to re in research. So I was um, basically compiling a bunch of the consults that the bioethics department completes on research participants who have questionable ability to consent to research. So it was a fascinating project. It got to know a lot of sort of the logistics around consenting individuals into research um, and also got to talk to a lot of different people across departments. So it was a, a great networking opportunity. Um, then the following summer, I completed the Gateways to the Laboratory program at Wild Cornell Medical College, our medical school. Um, and that was a program that was aimed towards students who are interested in the MD-PhD path. Uh, and so what they did in addition to, to granting us a, a research experience for 10 weeks um, was we had a, a mentor who is a current MD-PhD student. Um, so we had sort of that informal mentorship um, and I'm still in contact with her today. So it's a great um, opportunity um, as well as we had a journal club, which is just uh, an opportunity to get to read some of the primary literature, these just like scientific articles, uh, and discuss that with MD-PhD students. Um, and we also had opportunities to shadow. So it was sort of across the board, a great opportunity for professional development, um, and just to understand what the physician scientist path is like, um, and sort of live it with the current students. So it was, it was a great program. And then Last summer, um, given all of the uncertainty of the pandemic and everything like that, um, I was able to contact my research team from my first internship um, from NIH. And so I was working on that project remotely. Um, and so this is sort of to emphasize, um, it's something that the other panelists also mentioned that, that you know, it's, it's, these opportunities are great in and of themselves, but they also provide 
sort of a contact, a point of contact to um, continue that relationship and continue these projects that you start during a summer. So that's super exciting um, since, I mean, it's been so long since um, since I started working on that, now we're writing up the manuscript for publication. So um, you won't necessarily get a publication um, out of these experiences just because they are, you know, pretty short term, eight to 10 weeks um, during the summer. But if you continue those, those projects um, remotely if possible or going back the following summer through an informal or formal program, um, you're able to, to potentially get to that publication. Um, that's to say that, you know, if you end up applying to these programs and getting in, that's great. Uh, but you can also get these research experiences by contacting uh, principal investigators or PIs uh, directly, um, because these programs are competitive and, and it's okay that it's not formal. Um, so just like really encourage you guys to, to go out there and put yourself out there. Um, and whether it be through a formal program or not. And we'll definitely be talking more about um, other things, but hopefully um, that was clear. So uh, I think now is a good time to move on to the panel, Vic. Thank you guys, our amazing panelists. Big round of applause. Um, now is a, a brief bit of time during the hour and a half to just ask your questions, just uh, keep in mind that um, as, as Joanna foreshadowed over there, um, we will be going through already like what to look out for an application. So we will already have um, detailed information for you regarding resumes, CVs, emailing principal investigators, publications to include in those emails. Uh, I don't know if I already said cover letters um, and then official transcript requests, all that stuff. So probably not the best time to ask about that in this panel. This is more for just like personal experience, um, that type of thing, and, and um, what it was like getting, you know, assimilated into the lab environment, all that stuff, um, anything you wanna ask. Uh, we will also be going through like how to find um, formal internship opportunities as well as funding opportunities, so stay tuned for that. Just wanted to foreshadow that so that, you know, the questions that you do ask here um, can be, geared towards something else. And then one final thing before we get right into that, um, someone asked about where, you know, slides will be shared. If you put your net ID in the chat um, in public, that'd be great uh, so that we can then send it out to all of you. So during the, this would now be a great time to start inputting your net ID. So, um, and your questions, so. And maybe we can start us off um, before everyone uh, starts asking. Um, if everyone could, if we could just go through all the panelists and, and provide some brief answers to um, what you gained from your summer research experience, uh, whether that be networking, mentors, um, just so everyone sort of gets an idea of what you got out of it. Um, and also, sorry, I just wanted to make a quick, so I will be, um, some people are messaging me privately. We will definitely take in your questions as well. Um, so I'll keep note of that. So thank you so much for sending those in. Does anyone feel free to jump in? Sure, I'll go ahead. Uh, if you wanna switch back to my slide. So as I mentioned, my first experience was in person and actually, um, the first experience that I had, which was at the NIH, I did it three summers. So I actually started my junior year of high school and then my senior year of high school. And then it was my sophomore year of college. And actually I'm a transfer student. So my first two years I did in community college and I got two associate's degrees before getting to Cornell. So this experience was really important for me because since my first institution wasn't a research institution, um, it was really difficult to find experiences. And so uh, the NIDDK step up short-term research experience for underrepresented persons, basically it was great because I was able to do research at an institution that I chose. So if you apply to this program, you can uh, do research in any institution if you want, that you want. So you can stay close to home or you can go across the country and they don't really care. Um, and they'll uh, help with travel and with stay if that's something that you need and you also get a stipend. And so really this experience was the reason that I got into research in the, per in the first place because since I started in high school, it was something I never really knew about. 
um, and my family's not really in STEM. So as an immigrant and everything, it was something very new to me, but um, it was something that really solidified my interest in biomedical engineering and what I wanted to pursue. So definitely I got great mentorship during this program and um, I would really definitely recommend it as Mika said to try to go into programs at the NIH if possible, just because the NIH is such a great experience, not only just uh, in terms of the research, but also if you're at the NIH for other programs, you have the ability to do clinical work, maybe shadow in the hospital, and there's like great opportunities outside of the lab. Um, and then in terms of my uh, remote experience, which was LGS SOAR, and it's through Emory, specifically the graduate school, I was able to do remote research in the biomedical engineering department at Georgia Tech because Georgia Tech's uh, BME department is combined with Emory. And so it was very intimidating at first when they told us that it was remote because I, being as though BME research usually is very wet lab and hands on, I was kind of intimidated about what am I really going to get out of this? Like, yeah, I'll be home and it'll be nice, but I wanted to make this like an impactful summer, especially because as a transfer student, you have a little less time to really get hands-on research experience, whether it be at Cornell or somewhere else. But this ended up being an amazing uh, experience. My uh, PI, principal investigator, Dr. Pot, he's very well known in the field and he was such a great mentor and especially with everything going on in the world outside of the lab he was very outspoken on it and we had conversations about it during journal clubs and during lab presentations because he wanted to make sure that everyone not only focused on the research but also focused on themselves and, and taking care of themselves so that was a really great thing and obviously another thing that i got it out of it was ultimately a research publication but as mika said all of these experiences are not gonna result in a research publication. This was just something that ended up happening, which I'm very grateful for, but a research publication doesn't determine how successful a, a experience is. It's really just a matter of the competencies that you really learn out of the program. And if you're applying to medical school, you'll know that there's certain core competencies that you really should have in order to be able to work with patient interaction and things like that, which are things that you can learn in the research field as well, even if it's not clinical research. And then one other big thing that, as Mika mentioned, that you really get out of these experiences is the networking. And ultimately that turns into reference letters if you're going to be applying to, to uh, graduate school or other research opportunities. That was really what I got out of mine. Amazing. Does anyone else like to go or do you want me to read out some questions that have already been asked? I would love to add something to this um, <clears throat> in terms of what I got out of it. So um, I had an, uh, I think this is a good example of, of getting involved in a field that you might not necessarily be interested in. So I think um, at least I put a lot of pressure on myself to be like, oh my God, like I need to know exactly what I want to do my research in. Um, you know, I need to get the, and the research that I get involved in needs to be so specific to that. Um, and that was so not the case for me. So as I said, bioethics the first summer, and then I was doing computational biology the second summer. But these are, these are, I guess what's fortunate about these experiences is that they're short. And so you're able to see, okay, you're able to really immerse yourself in this field and say, hey, is this something that really interests me? As undergrads, we're not expected to be doing research in exactly what we're interested in because how are we supposed to know what we're interested in, right? So this is just an opportunity to explore. And so I guess what the message that I wanna convey to you is that it's okay not to know what you wanna research and it's okay to get involved in something that you might not necessarily think that you're interested in. However, that being said, um, what was great about my experiences were that I was really inspired by what I was doing. And so my opportunity doing computational biology research, I literally did not know how to code before this. So it was a really steep learning curve. Um, but after that, I, it prompted me to want to take computer science courses once I got back to Cornell. Um, and so I ended up taking three semesters of computer science. Um, and, and I think I want to do my PhD in something very much computational. And so it's just like comes to show that you know, you might not know right now, but you can let these experiences shape your interests. Um, so I think go in with an open mind about the programs that you apply to and the, the places that you end up 
going to. Um, so don't be too bummed if it's not exactly what you think you want to do because your, your interests will change and that's like great. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to say is that these opportunities usually provide a stipend. And so a lot of us would otherwise have to work um, during the summers. And so what's great about participating in these programs is that you don't need to work in addition. Um, they provide a pretty nice stipend, not like not amazing, but it's okay. Um, and they sometimes cover your housing. Um, so definitely make sure to read the websites about like what they do cover um, with the stipend and um, yeah. And then one last thing, sorry. Um, I think what I, you know, the main thing that I got out of this was also more confidence in myself um, in the lab. Um, my principal investigator from Cornell um, told me that um, after coming back from this second summer experience, she noted that I was a lot more confident and that I sort of carried myself very differently. And that's just because I was in a, in a completely different environment doing something that I was very, you know, <laughs> um unsure about um and so you grow a lot by getting involved by networking uh or being forced to do those kinds of things um whether it be in a virtual environment or not um so i think that's another huge thing um so if it's not clear by now definitely apply to these programs <laughs> that was amazing Mika. there was also a question directed for you so while you you're still speaking um uh, this person wanted you to just repeat your major again, and if you were on the pre-med track to be able to do research with uh, Wild Cornell. Yes, so I was a biology major concentrating in genetics, genomics, and development, as well as computational biology, sort of, um, and I am on the MD-PhD track, so yes, technically I am on the pre-med track, but I'm more on the research side of things. Um, I think people go to medical school for different reasons, and um, I think my interest came more from uh, the the research side of things. So I hope that answered your question. And um, I think uh, regarding the Wild Cornell opportunities, as Cornell students, um, people at Wild Cornell pay more attention to you. Um, so if you cold email, you know, so if you just like randomly email a, PI, a principal investigator at Wild Cornell. Uh, they're a lot more likely to respond to you just because they they see the Cornell email and um, networks really work. Um, and so if someone is from Cornell um, or things like that, like take advantage of that. Um, and yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Definitely um, send your question in the chat if I didn't. So. Amazing. Does anyone else want to add um, anyone else from the panel about what they've gained from their experiences? Now's the time. Yeah, um, I'd love to add on to what Mika was saying about like, kind of um, not being in a research experience that's directly related to what you think you want to do or like you don't know what you want to do. So when I was in the um, the Center for Visual Science program at University of Rochester, they placed me in a biomedical engineering lab. And at first I thought this was a mistake because I'm a music major, like I'm a psychology major. So I was really, really confused why um, they were putting me in this lab. And so the project I was working on um, was tracking neural, like basically like how our brains respond to rep repetition and regularity in music. So they wanted someone who was familiar with like music theory. Um, and it was a very computational, uh, computationally intense um, internship. I had no clue how to code in MATLAB um, and I had to learn that, but it, it was a really good experience because um, I hadn't had that exposure before. And um, we did some uh, brain imaging stuff with EEG um, and I really found an interest in that side, but not really the computational side. Um, and I kind of was like, okay, so I, I learned about like this stuff and I, that's not what I want to do. And that's okay because it directs your research interest, like, um, to something you do want to do. Um, it's almost more important to figure out what you don't want to do than it is to determine right away what you do want to do. Um, and also from that, um, internship. So I, like I said before, I'm applying to PhD programs right now. And um, I applied to University of Rochester and they gave me my interviewers today and my PI is one of my interviewers. So that is definitely something I um, gained from this experience, just like the, the networking. And I recognize some of the other professors' names because I had talked with them um, when I was in that um, internship. So yeah, I just like to say that if you think that you're 
I guess my advice to you is that even if you think like you're not smart enough for something, you are like, don't doubt yourself um, because you're going to gain something from whatever experience you do. Imposter syndrome will try to get you down, but you're smart enough. I think one more thing to, to add real quick is just networking, not only that the network that you gain from the internship, but also how you can use your kind of current network um, and resources at Cornell to help you get into internships. So for my lab at Cornell, the Memory Neuroscience Research Lab, um, one of our studies was kind of connected to my internship in a way. And so the PI of my internship program knew the PI of my, you know, at Cornell Research Lab. And that definitely helped me from right out the gate, just form a connection with the internship and get into it. And then from there, again, having all the connections I gained through the internship with the PI and the other researchers and the other doctors that I was around on the floor every day, um, that helped me a lot to get into, you know, work with a new PI that was affiliated with Triple. Um, so I think it's important to, you know, understand how useful and how great the internships are and how you can get all these networks, but also how you can use the Cornell name and the connections that you might already have with professors to help you get into all these great opportunities and internship programs. Yeah, and I would also add on to that with um, Cornell PIs. They're also there to serve as um, mentors. And if you don't have that kind of a relationship with your Cornell PI, that's okay if that's something you're comfortable with. But if you do find that you have a great relationship or you're really interested in learning more about their career, even if maybe your Cornell research isn't directly the kind of research you wanna do in the future, um, try to work on that relationship as well beyond just like your research meetings and get to know them. I know many of us tend to work with grad students um, and they're also phenomenal and can serve as great resources, but getting to know your PI has really transformed the way that I view research. And um, my Cornell PI has really served as a great advisor for me in terms of like just talking through my future and thinking about like what I want to do in the summers, where do I want to end up? What do I want my path to look like? And some people's paths might be a little bit more overgrown than other people's paths and that's okay, but talking with um, my PI has certainly helped shape sort of where I see myself going in the future and just being very open and with him about like what I also like am looking for in sort of a mentorship relationship. So would highly recommend just getting to know your Cornell PIs if you have them or in general, just any PI that you truly resonate with because they can serve as a super valuable person um, both in your future and then also in sort of like your short term goals as well. And I think to go off of what John was saying, I think that's a really good point about taking advantage, um, not just like academically of the people around you. Um, I think a lot of people on the call are probably not in labs yet. Um, but that being said, your professors are a lot of the time PIs um, independently. So I think just taking advantage of your professors um, as well, and they potentially can provide a connection to um, a way to get into a lab or stuff like that. So I just wanted to add that um, your professors likely have their own lab as well. Um, so it, even if they're not necessarily your PI, um, it, talking to your professors in their office hours is a great uh, time and place to do that. All right, all right. Thank you guys so much. Um, I think now, yes, we are gonna move on to uh, my section of this presentation. So. Um, I didn't really introduce myself. Um, I'm Victoria. Um, I am a junior chemistry major minoring in German studies. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs for the peer mentorship program, um, which is part of the Cornell undergraduate research board. And essentially what the peer mentorship program does is uh, sort of twofold. One, um, we provide presentations and workshops on a semesterly basis for you to learn how to obtain um, a research position at Cornell and a long-term one too. And then the other part that we mentioned already in a lab in your field of interest. And um, once we pair you with them, they can give you more personalized and individual advice um, and can review all the components of your applications or, or whatever it may be to help you succeed in obtaining a lab position. So I just wanted to put that out there in case you're interested in being part of the peer mentorship program, which um, will have applications out in the spring, because what I'm about to talk about um, for the next couple slides are 
portions of the peer mentorship program. So you're in luck, you're getting a little sneak peek, um, but it's a lot of good information and um, ready to get started. So this is about what to look out for in summer research applications. Now, something to note, um, I wanna stick with this slider right here because, um, oh no, sorry, Joanna, you were doing the right thing. The next slide, sorry about that, um, is that, as Mika had um, said before, um, if you guys may recall, that there are formal internship programs and those are amazing. You know, you can apply, they're selective, but you can still get them. In the case that, for example, you don't get into a formal internship program, no big deal. There are tons of labs all over the country, all over the world. And all you need to do is just reach out to the principal investigators or the heads of the labs um, wherever you want, at Cornell, outside of Cornell. And um, what I'm about to go through here is a very good, uh, it's not the only way, but it's a pretty formulaic way to really um, uh, introduce yourself to a PI for the first time um, and to really demonstrate interest in the research. And the thing I want to highlight about this is um, there are also formal internship programs like the NIH where um, I know, uh, for example, like um, I actually met Mika at the NIH too. <laughs> um, and we uh, both went through the process of like having to, you know, apply formally with like cover letter, resume, all that stuff, grades, but then also having to reach out to the principal investigators um, that we were interested in, in order to um, actually, you know, secure a place in a lab. So there's sort of two steps to that. So just be aware about, you know, internship programs that have that sort of format. Um, so this type of format will work, um, but of course you can modify in the ways that you want. But the main points are that if you are sending like copying and pasting the same type of email to every single principal investigator, it is probably not a good email. So it needs to be very, very individualized. There should not be really anything um, that you can copy and paste other than like contact me through here or like um, I'm best available to arrange a meeting here or something like more logistical um, or I'll be in Ithaca this semester, things like that. That's fine, but everything else needs to be specific to that PI and the lab. How do you start preparing for like that type of content in the body of the email? Well, go to their website. Every like lab or department, you know, has um, faculty members and each of them has like their own website talking about the members of the group, all that stuff. So um, it'll talk about all the projects, all the publication. Um, the thing that in mind is uh, before I get into like what, um, make sure that you send your email a timely and structured manner. So what's important is that you don't want to send it at like 7 p.m. on a Saturday. You want to send it Monday, like 8 a.m. or something like that. Um, and what I would recommend is that if you don't want to wake up Monday at like 7.50 and send your email that you've drafted already, just have it, you know, go to Gmail or Outlook or do the, the pre-send or the pre-scheduled um, send, um, and then it should be fine. You can choose whatever time you'd like to send it. And then whenever you get a response, respond immediately, and then make sure that if you're not getting a response, you follow up as needed. So um, don't do every day, don't follow up every week, even maybe every two weeks, you know, to, just be respectful of their time, they're busy people, they're probably getting lots of emails. Um, so, so don't stress out, um, but uh, make sure that these emails are individualized so that you're more likely to get an actual response. Um, the PIs get lots of emails from undergrads every single year. Um, both from within and outside their institutions. So what's going to make you different? What's going to make them actually think that you're interested and qualified for a position in their lab? So this is where, you know, the really important stuff comes in. My biggest recommendation, and this, is, this works, this just works, is that you have to look at their publications. This is um, key. You don't just go look at the, the descriptions on the website and say like, oh yeah, I saw that you're, you're working on this, like, can I join? R read the research that like they've been publishing recently. Um, I actually have worked for a PI that has um, a website and you know, it's not updated at all. So that's a way for them to weed out people, <laughs> for him to weed out people that um, actually don't read you know, his publications. So make sure that you're reading the publications because that's definitely what they're up to more recently. So 
now you're probably like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to read a publication. I'm an undergrad. I have no clue. I'm so stressed out. Don't worry. Same, same. So what's most important is um, getting the main ideas, getting the gist of things. Uh, look at the abstract, look at the discussion sections. Um, maybe try and look at the results too, but I would start with the abstract and the discussion sections because those are like the bigger ideas, the implications of the studies, the purpose of the studies, the motivations for the studies, all that stuff. Um, and then if you know, um, don't don't be afraid of the publications. I mean, they they're they're dense. Some of them can be very dense, um, and you know, that's you know why they're they are at that level that they are because they've obtained a long education to to work in that type of field. So, like I said, the main ideas are really important. Now, when you um, first, you know, have a subject line in your email. Don't say like, can I work in your lab? The main focus of the email is to start off with the interest in the research. So for example, like interest in your work on this. Um, yes. And then, you know, you want to start your email talking about that, like the interest in your email. So start introducing yourself, your major, you know, your year, um, blah, blah, blah. And then say, you know, I came across your paper talking about this and then do like a summary of, you know, what, what you enjoyed most about the paper. Again, getting the main ideas. If you have previous research experience, um, that's great. Talk about that in the following paragraph, you know, like, um, I'm interested in this because I previously worked on this. But um, I actually just worked with someone that didn't have previous research experience. Drafting an email is totally fine. You just exclude that part. But you talk about experiences that have led you or interests that have led you to want to look into this person's lab. Um, so um, it's totally fine to not have previous research experience. But if it's if applicable, like make sure that you talk about what you did, uh, what you learned from it, uh, why you enjoyed it, why it has led you to look into this person's new lab. And then um, this is, then you follow up with saying like, I'm interested in learning more about your PI's uh, research group. And then um, talk about logistics, how you'd like to meet, where you can be reached out to say like, I would like to discuss the possibility of working in your lab, like beginning the semester and for the remainder of my time at Cornell. Um, if you wanna talk about long-term, make sure you mention long-term. Um, if you just wanna do it for the summer, mention just this summer, totally up to you. And then um, it'd be a good idea to say, like, I've attached my resume. Um, if you want a cover letter, it's not necessary. Um, if you want to attach your unofficial transcript, I'll talk about um, how, how to do that. Um, then, then do that as well. And if you also want, you can say, I've provided a list of references below. Give their address, give their email, their phone number, all that, and their title and where they work, and then things like that. So. This is um, a very good formulaic way of um, getting started with emails. And um, in order to really get more in depth with this, um, I have resources at the end uh, where you can look more um, at examples. Um, you can also join the peer mentorship program, but I'm not trying to like advertise the PMP here. Um, but yeah, let's go on to the next thing. That's, you know, if it's a more informal setting. Now, um, I will talk a lot less about, um, in a lot less detail about the resumes and the CVs, but the point of a resume or a CV, first of all, what's the difference? A resume is only one to two pages. A CV can be however long you want. It's basically sort of a track record of like all the experiences that you've had and the relevant experiences and qualifications um, that make you suitable for the research position of interest. Every resume and CV is a living document and it has to be adjusted for every research position that you do. So similar to the emails, you cannot just have like a resume that fits every single type of experience. Um, I know for myself, like I'm interested in a lot of things. So I, tr I tailor my resume depending on the type of program that I'm working uh, to apply for. Um, but there are some required and recommended sections for all resumes. It's just that depending on, you know, what type of experience you're applying for, you maybe want to rearrange the order. So for a research experience, um, if you have previous research experience, you would want to put that first, of course. So um, definitely your personal information, like your, um, if you want your address, I don't put my address because I don't want people going after me, but like, it's fine. You can put that, um, your phone number, your email, um, a professional email, not like, um, twinkle, twinkle, little star, one, two, one, eight, like, don't do that. Um, your education. So 
this would be just your school, the, the bachelor's degree that you're um, planning to obtain. If you are in high school, you can put your high school education, but then after like sophomore year, you don't need to put that anymore. Your GPA, um, if you are a high school student, you can put your GPA, um, but if you are a first semester freshman, it's not totally necessary. Um, in addition to that, um, let me see what else. Yes, your major, your minors, any of that stuff, um, totally good to put under education. And then uh, related experiences, right? So as I was saying, if it's a research experience, that would come up first, um, previous research experiences. Um, but if you don't have any previous research experience, the goal of the resume is that you have the qualifications and the qualities and the experiences that make you a good researcher, but that doesn't mean that you must have had research experience. So I can be a good communicator and a good team player by being in like an orchestra, even though that's not research. So things like that. Um, there, there's a whole list here. I don't have to go through all of them, but these are the types of experiences that you would want to put on your resume to show that you're um, qualified. And then if you're also interested, um, there's a big emphasis on the technical skills and the lab techniques, um, as well as like any programming languages. Uh, this is super important because if you're going to be working in a lab, they'll probably want to know like, well, what can you do? Um, and then foreign languages are great too. A lot of PIs like to see that. Um, any leadership experiences in student or non-student organizations, any volunteership, community outreach, any hobbies, great. And then make sure to include dates for each experience. So either on the left-hand column or the right-hand column, up to you. Um, and then the most important tips for this is just, you need to use active verbs, active verbs. Do not be like, I did this, or like, sometimes it's okay to use participate, but I participate in this. Say like, what was the overarching goal of the experience? And then what was your role in it? What specifically did you do? So like, I recruited, I like uh, directed, I like led, I presented all these things. Um, and then make sure that you demonstrate some form of working with people, leadership, uh, taking initiative. Those are like hot topics, you know, for a resume. Great to put on there. And then um, if you have any stats, like something that I like to do to advertise the peer mentorship program is like, um, I like have led a curriculum for up to 450 mentees. Like that's like, wow, it's a lot of people, that kind of thing. Um, and then, like I said before, resumes and CVs are living documents, so you need to make sure that you update them. And then these next few slides are just sort of demonstrating a few points that I hit. Um, so I think next slide. Yeah, so th this is what I mean by like the active verbs. So if you um, are currently in the position, then you want to say like performing or like participating. Um, but if you have already completed the experience, you're not in it anymore, then you would um, go to past tense. And then the next is, slide is just like a way to format. So this is like a beautifully laid out resume. Uh, one tip that um, I learned is that um, don't use, so use um, template guides or like template resources like Cornell Optimal Resume and stuff, but do not actually um, input your, your text into those templates, just like use them as a guide because actually uh, PIs can tell when you have used that form of a template. And I would recommend Word beyond any other uh, place to like draft your resume. If anyone else has recommendations from the panel though, I'd like to know, but Word tends to be better. Google Docs sometimes is very messy when it comes to then downloading as a PDF. You would always wanna submit your resume as a PDF attached in the email. And the resumes and CVs are also for like um, formal internship programs as well. So this is not something you just attach in the email. A lot, if not like a really good number, um, uh, request a resume or a CV in a formal internship uh, program. So then the next thing, I believe it's cover letters. Yay. Really quickly, okay. can I just add, uh, yeah. for the resume, I use Overleaf, which is basically, it's written in latex, which is kind of like a, it's a programmed um, resume. It's not very difficult to use. I'll put the link for Overleaf, and it's a free system, and basically people have created templates, and then obviously their content is in there, but you use the script of the actual code to input your um, 
your data and basically it self formats, which is really nice. So the spacing doesn't change and anything like that. So basically your content content gets put in. Um, and I've found it really helpful for CVs and resumes. So I'll put the link there for if anyone wants to use that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't let you <laughs> have the chance to speak that. Um, so then next for the Sorry, the cover letter is basically a personal statement um, where you, it's roughly a page long, single spaced, um, your, your interest in the program, why you think you're a good fit for the program. Um, you could attach this in like your, your initial email um, if you want to write a cover letter uh, for that, but you also will have the body of the email itself. So this is more, I would say, for formal internship programs where they request a cover letter. There are some formal internship programs that have um, questions um, that are like drafted with a pre-made for you. And so you just need to hit on those points um, and add any information as needed. But sometimes cover letters are very, you know, write a cover letter. You know, it's kind of like, what do you do about that? So I've listed some major components of the cover letter that are very important to, um, you know, hit on. So introduction about, like, as I was saying, your interest in the program, um, talk about if, if you haven't already mentioned in the application before, like what your major is, um, your career goals, all that stuff, um, your program and research interests um, in general, and then why you would think the program uh, that you're applying for is going to make you uh, in, turn you into a better researcher or further your interests more um, and help with your long term career goals and then mention what those career goals are. I need to emphasize that there's no particular order to these sections. They're numbered, but they're not in any particular order. It just needs to flow and it needs to be an argumentative essay. It's not creative, nothing like that. It's like, like, I'm great. Here's why you should take me. This is what I want to do, that kind of thing. Um, and then again, sort of like the resumes and everything, tailor each cover letter to the specific position or field. Although I will say that anytime I have applied to multiple internship programs, I have sort of been recycling sections of my cover letters. Um, and as I was saying earlier, I have a lot of different interests. So, you know, if I'm applying to a more global health oriented thing versus like a basic bio thing, I'm definitely not going to talk about global health as much in the basic bio research cover letter. But for example, my career goals, I would probably still keep the same thing from the other letter. So something like that. Um, uh, use active verbs again, and then make sure there's as little overlap with the resume and CV as possible if that is also in the application. Although if it's not both, if they're both not in the same application, then you can definitely, um, you know, use uh, some from the others. Um, and then self-advocacy. Don't be afraid to be like, this is why I'm very qualified. Like, take me kind of thing. Um, be confident about it. Don't be arrogant, but definitely um, say like, this is the experience I've had. A lot of people know that you're just starting out. You're an undergrad. You're not with a PhD and like multiple degrees. They totally understand. So, um, but still make sure that you are being, you know, confident in yourself and in your abilities as um, Emily had touched on um, earlier. Um, Next slide. Thing, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add something real quick to the cover letter. So something I found um, over maybe like the past year, I've written a lot of cover letters for different um, things. And when you're talking about your experiences and your skills, um, so you don't end up sounding exactly like your resume or CV, what I find it's really helpful to do is to tie those skills into where they'd be most useful in that research opportunity or their lab. So if you have stat skills and you've done like statistical analyses and maybe you're proficient in like R, SPSS, um, mention that when briefly talking about like my most recent research experience was this, I gained that, and this would be directly translatable skill to like X, Y, and Z if they have like an analytical component in their research lab. Or like maybe it's more surface level and it's just about the like topics and the overlaps. Um, but tying that to their work in more of this like concrete manner rather than just having it listed as like these are your skill sets on your resume and CV, continue to show that you took the time to research that lab or that research opportunity that you kind of understand what they're working on and how you could be most useful because then they can also start to see where you would um, be an asset to their lab. So that's something you can also think about when you're drafting a cover letter. I just want to jump in there and, and say that um, 
it's totally okay to not have an experience before the one that you're applying to that is directly related to what you're doing. I think uh, Joanna touched upon a really important point, which are translatable skills. So whether that be, as, as Vic was saying, um, on a sports team, or I mean, I, I, like people have to start somewhere, right? And so you can't be expected to have an MD before you start medical school or have a PhD before you start your first research position. So don't be so hard on yourself. Like don't expect that you're coming in with all of these skills. Um, because that, I mean, personally for me, that made me really insecure when I was first applying to my first research positions and things like that. Um, so what's expected of me as an undergrad? Um, not much is expected, just interest and, um, a sort of willingness to learn and, and just like genuine interest. I think that is the only thing that's sort of expected. And, um, you can learn new skills once you're on the job, but you want to show, um, that you're capable of learning new skills, that you're interested in learning new skills. And that's the most important. So, um, to emphasize that, um, so you, you don't feel, um, like you're like underprepared to be applying. That's why you're applying. So yeah, hopefully that helps. Yes, definitely. And I also, um, what I would say um, in terms of like how to also talk about your academic interests, because um, it, it can seem hard, like how do I talk about being on a sports team and then saying I want to do research, things like that. Another place that's great to start is your classes. What have you learned in your classes? What really stimulated your interest? Um, that definitely helped with me as um you know, I was uh, trying to apply for internship programs and um, they requested cover letters. So that's also a great place to start. Um, I just got a question real quick. Um, do you recommend meeting with a PI face-to-face -face or online before sending an email asking about research opportunities? I think um, the point of the email is that you haven't met them before. And so unless, you know, they're, that person is a professor of your class, um, it can be very hard to meet with them face to face before emailing them. So actually, um, funny thing, like um, I have gotten into a lab at Cornell where the professor um, of my gen chem class like is the PI. So it's very easy through like office hours and through that type of experience to obtain a research position, but no emails were required there because you already know the person um, face to face. So the emails more for like when you don't know the PI, that's a great option. Um, hopefully that answers your question. If you have any follow-ups. I want to add to that. Um, I, my personal approach, and this is, you know, I, there's no one magic formula to reach out to a PI. Um, and that's a whole other, panel content but i think um just very quickly it is i mean in my experience it's great to show your interest before you ask whether they have space in their lab so that first email doesn't even have to say you know like do you have space in your lab like they weren't born yesterday they know that you're interested in joining their lab if you're emailing them um so i think just expressing your interest and in having a conversation to meet them and understand what they do in the lab um, and then sort of, I mean, they'll get the hint um, or even, you know, explicitly ask, you know, do you have space in your lab? Um, there's no centralized resource at Cornell that has sort of all of the open spaces, but definitely look at your email to see if there are professors that are specifically looking for students um, or um, look in labs where seniors are graduating um, and those PIs are likely going to be taking in more undergrads. So that's another way of doing that very quickly. And one quick thing, don't feel bad if they don't answer the first time. It's actually, you need to be persistent just because uh, obviously professors, if they're PIs as well, they're super busy. So I remember emailing labs three or four times before I got a response. So they definitely don't get mad if you do that. If anything, it shows how passionate you are about getting into the lab. And so don't feel bad if they don't answer. And if someone doesn't answer at all, then that's okay. And don't feel bad about that as well. It's not about you. It's maybe it's about timing with them or anything else, but just make sure to be persistent. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, okay, yes, this slide is your holy grail. Um, this is where you can get all the examples. Um, I highly recommend starting with the NIH one. Um, and I wanted to emphasize that, you know, we've been talking a lot about STEM here, right? Um, 
this applies really to any field, I would say, um, in terms of the, the format, uh, demonstrating the interest, uh, applying like transferable skills. Um, so I would start with the NIH one because it touches on the cover letters, the emails to a PI and the resumes, but then we also have like um, some extra links for some of the other things I had talked about, like the CVs and the cover letters. So make sure to take a look at that. And if you've put your net ID in the chat, you should be receiving the slides with um, this information. So um, I think there was one final slide about, yes, yes, transcripts. So a lot of um, formal internship programs, I mean, and also you can attach unofficial transcripts in your um, initial email uh, to a PI, but I'm mainly going to be speaking about formal internship programs. They may ask that you submit an official transcript. Um, and the way that you do that, so I know that the, the pictures may not be large enough for you to see, but you wanna go to studentessentials.cornell.edu um, and then you will go to where like the blue um, column with like all the tabs are um, going from like top left to then top right, then bottom left, bottom right. You're gonna go to like order a transcript and all that. Um, and then what you will do is you'll see in the top right that there's like this blue hyperlinked thing. That's where you request a transcript to go to yourself um, or like request for you. Um, and then once you click on that, you'll order an e-transcript um, in the bottom left. And then finally, bottom right is where you fill out all the information. Now you can either send the transcript to yourself, to your own email, or the email of like the lab coordinator for the formal internship program. So it's all pretty self-explanatory after that. So I didn't want to get into too much detail, but basically it's very self-explanatory if you just remember that you need to go to Student Essentials to request um, an official transcript. Um, and then if you send it to yourself and you download it, it then becomes, um, It'll say void across it, but what formal internship program coordinators know is that like there's they're given a set of instructions on how to make it not void. Um, so don't worry about that. Just send it as you would just with this process. And so I just wanted to put that information out there because a lot of people may not be aware of like how to send an official transcript. So it's really important to go to student essentials and then the rest is very self-explanatory and make sure to click the link. I think it says send to yourself. It's under the, the search bar, send to yourself or a third party um, and then you should be good. Um, I also wanted to add to that as well, two things. I put this in the chat as well just so people know, but you can access this through Student Center as well if like you're not as like haven't been using student essentials. Um, it's just under your My Academics tab. Um, and then second, something that I think is super valuable and also comes with sort of like planning for deadlines, especially if you like need a transcript, is they're fairly quick in processing your request, but it does take like, or could take up to two hours, I think is like the longest I've had to wait for a transcript to be emailed to myself to then upload to um, a more official program. So just like make sure you're planning that because in that like sort of break period where you order it, you get the receipt, but you don't actually get your transcript. It can be like kind of nerve wracking, um, just waiting for it to come into your inbox. So know that it takes a little time, but if you do it like in advance or the day before, just like allotting yourself um, at least a couple of hours to get that sent to either you or the institution that it's supposed to be going to, um, just know that there is a lag and it's not immediate. Thank you for mentioning that, Joanna. Um, yes, Mika. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to add this. Um, so Vic mentioned um, looking at examples and things like that. Um, but I think I wanted to emphasize to all of you to get feedback. No one is born knowing how to write a cover letter or write a good CV uh, and personalize it to one program or another. Um, so the best way to make sure that you're doing the correct thing is to get feedback. And so at Cornell, there's so, so many resources um, that are there to give you feedback on these things. And these are literally professionals who do nothing but this. Um, so it's people that will be really, really helpful um, uh, to you and your personal situation. And they're amazing people. They've helped me prepare for interviews. Um, prepare my CV for different programs. Um, so um, take advantage of this. I think this is a resource that's severely underused and very helpful. So 
take advantage of the resources that this university provides to you. Um, other people to, to these, so this is um, the student services, um, number four, uh, but other people that you can also potentially go to um, as your academic advisor, everyone has an academic advisor um, for biology majors, you also have a student advisor. Um, so depending on what kinds of experiences they've applied to, they might be great people to read your essays, um, look at your CV, um, also curb um, the peer mentorship program, uh, your mentors are great. Um, and, um, and also family and friends. I mean, you, they, they might not be good specifically for more technical questions, um, but if they can just read your essays to make sure it flows um, or make sure that you're sort of, you're representing yourself very genuinely, um, those are great people to, to read um, for spelling mistakes or things like that. Um, you don't want to have spelling mistakes and um, you want it to really be a good representation of who you are. And there's no right way to do any of these things. I think it's going to be very personal to you and recognizing that I think will help you a lot. Um, but highlight again, Cornell Student Services, make an appointment. You will not regret it. <laughs> and um, I wanted to add that um, SACNAS is actually holding um, it was officially meant to be sort of a more um, interview prep um, for uh, students that are applying to, to graduate school. Um, but I talked to the graduate students and they are happy to read your applications. Um, so this is another resource, um, given that a lot of the applications are due soon. Um, if you sign up, when, once you get this PowerPoint, the here has a link. Um, so you can just add your email there and schedule a time to meet with a graduate student. These are great people. These have these people have you know applied and gone into graduate school programs. So they're very good at communicating research and ideas, and um, they're super creative people. So I think that they can help um, craft your your application if you have any questions. Um, take advantage. Don't be shy. Um, I know what. At, when I, a few years ago I was super shy about these things but these you know these people really want to help so um take advantage of them um don't be shy <laughs> uh yes sorry um this is just now sort of a free-for-all for the panelists um to talk about letters of recommendation and references um I just wanted to point out a few things um sort of the, the first thing is that letters of rec, I think everyone on the panel will, will know um, and agree and, and advocate for this, is that a, a true letter of recommendation that supports you is one where the person writing the letter knows you. So, you know, it can be very hard and uh, scary to think about, you know, if you're a first semester freshman, for example, you've only known a professor for so long, um, don't be afraid to think back on high school uh, professors if, if that applies to that formal internship program or um, if you want to use them as a reference where you know they've known you for years longer I think don't don't be afraid to really reflect on who has gotten to know you and and knows your qualities and your aspirations and who you've talked to the most and on a deep level you know there are lots of people that um, I'm sure you can probably think of that may not come across your mind right away because you're probably thinking oh I need a really reputable professor to like um, who's won the Nobel Prize to like advocate for me like it's not always about that it's it's about you know people that really really know you um, and then the second thing is and um, is that you need to look at requirements for you know the letters of recommendation that a formal internship program might request so if they're saying professors two professors then it needs to be two professors if it's saying two stem professors it needs to be two stem professors if it says uh two people that you know can speak on your academic and research um qualities then that could be one professor and someone you've done research with outside of cornell so you need to be careful with the wording and and follow those instructions um, there are times when you can even use non-STEM professors. Um, I, for the NIH, I used, um, a German professor because the PI that I wanted to connect with was German and I used that. So just get, get creative with it if you can. Um, and, genius, uh, genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so 
I, I would just recommend thinking about like all the different ways in which, you know, the, your recommenders are also good fits for the program, if that makes sense, by advocating for you. So now the panelists can, uh, you can jump in if you want. I can go ahead. Uh, so I know that if you're definitely applying to a lot of different programs, sometimes you get scared about once a professor or whoever is writing it uh, has accepted to ask them to like submit it to multiple places. But in reality, it's most likely going to be the same letter, if not very similar. Um, so don't be scared about telling them that you're applying to multiple programs and you're, they're usually very happy to do so, especially like if they're writing it because they want to help you, then that won't be an obstacle for them. One big tip that I have for that is if you are applying to a bunch of programs like last summer, I ended up applying to 13 programs. It was for no reason because it was just my imposter syndrome getting in the way. Um, but I ended up applying to 13 programs and I was like, oh my God, they're gonna have to submit it 13 times. So what I did was I put all of them, all of the programs into an Excel sheet with like the program, the link that they needed to send it to or like the directions and the deadline. And that really helps to organize what um, they need to do and like which ones they need to submit for first. And that really helps. And you can do that for grad school as well. Yeah, I would also echo that. I was recently having this conversation with one of my siblings here at home about like letters of recs and references because I have been fortunate to have wonderful people being willing to serve as recommenders, but I always like dread when I have to apply to things because I'm like, oh my gosh, like I don't want to ask too much of them or if like I've done research with the same PI for so many years now. And so I feel like I always like ask if he'll serve as a reference because he knows me best and all these things. But what I really got from those conversations with my one of my sisters was she said like, look, Joanna, this is their job. This is part of what like they have agreed to do, especially if it's a Cornell professor or a Cornell researcher. Like they know that mentorship is like a huge part of Cornell. Um, so definitely don't feel like you're um, asking too much of them if you are like being reasonable. Um, so like making it as easy as possible, as Andrea just said, like organizing things, giving them enough time, like those are all things to consider. And then subsequently too, like following up, if you get a position, you're really excited about it. They were an integral part of why you got that position. Um, and so like, make sure you thank them and that can look like a bunch of different things, but like doing something nice, like handwriting a thank you note if you're able to and sending it to them if you're not there or dropping it off at their office or like finding a creative way to say thank you is like just something that can really make you continue to stand out so that you're like recognizing them for helping you like in your future goals and future career path. Um, so would highly recommend um, not having like such fear about recommendations as I do, but also knowing that like you should do stuff in return and make sure that you're um, being the best version of yourself, especially if you're still working with them during this process. Um, and then I also wanted to quickly add to sort of on a different note with letters of rec and references. So there are um, obviously different ways that people approach recommendations. And I think coming from academic institutions, a lot of us um, have been able to work with individuals who are willing to write um, a letter of rec like fully for them and just like submit it blindly and um, that's typically how things work but um, sometimes especially if you're working with agencies outside of academia and more in sort of like the clinical fields or fields that are like very fast-paced and maybe mentorship isn't as big of a process um, is that they might ask you to draft your own letter of recommendation and then send it to them and they'll adapt it which is something that has only been asked of me once and I was um, surprise I think because I didn't know like oh this is something like you do um, but it certainly is just a way for them to save time and it also gives you like the opportunity to like think about what you contributed and what skills they might see of you um, but in those cases like definitely don't like overextend yourself like make it reasonable um, while also like trying to speak to your strengths and then they'll adapt it from there and that's just another way for them to save time so don't take it personally um, if that does happen and if you are in that situation and you like want to reach out to me or like talk to some of your friends or all of those resources are on Mika's last slide like I'm sure that many people have experiences um, similar to that and so there's like a way to navigate that and like a, a helpful manner um, and to not just be like confused about the whole process um, so I wanted to just add a plug there. 
so all everyone th this is super helpful information i think um everyone has talked about once you already have people that uh you want to recommend you but i think i personally struggled a lot with finding recommenders especially after one semester of being at cornell um i was just like i don't i you know i had you know, huge classes I, I did not get to know my professors after my first semester um and i'm sure a lot of you are on the same boat um either because you transferred into cornell um or it, you just didn't uh, do that because you didn't think that was important in the first semester and you're intimidated as a freshman and i totally understand where you're coming from um so i think i wanted to speak a little bit about how i thought about the recommendation process uh, for this first internship and um i actually asked one of my high school teachers after um my first semester at cornell my this was my biology teacher who had a, a really good um relationship with she recommended me for college um and i talked to a number of people and this is appropriate um mostly just after your i mean after your first semester i wouldn't do this as a as a sophomore necessarily um unless there's some you know situation that you can explain um but that's okay um to ask a, a high school teacher um and and then i asked someone from a a scholar program at cornell um who was not himself a professor um but this was someone who knew me since the beginning and knew what my goals were and i made sure to reach out and explain why it was that i wanted to participate in this program and um even though these sort of at the beginning it's okay not to have people that really know you um so don't put like so much pressure on yourself i think as you go on um you will be expected to have people that can really really advocate for you um but um i would say like as a freshman um don't be so hard on yourself i think that's something that i wish i had someone had told me um so i'm telling it to you um and um, especially if these professors as Vic was saying were not are not necessarily stem professors um just yeah someone who can speak to you and speak to you as a person they just want to put a face to your application so hopefully that helps um a few of you who might be struggling with this as well one more thing really quickly sorry um so in terms of when you're asking the person so it's kind of hard to be like not scared to tell them what specifically you want them to talk about but i've found that that's really helpful just because you want to have like diversification in terms of the letters that they're writing and so if there's certain things that you specifically want them to note don't be scared to actually ask them when you're asking them um to write it as well like oh i had this experience with you i if you could note this like specific thing um because i think that's like something very important for what i'm applying for um and most times they'll be completely fine with it and it gives them a better gauge of what they want that you want them to talk about so don't be scared to add that as well like specific details Bill, did you have something to say or uh yeah i can talk just a little bit briefly um expanding upon what mika said about like struggling to find um a recommender so when i was a sophomore i was applying to my triple research program and i really struggled with having two solid letters of recommendation i only really had my pi that knew me personally um and so i didn't really know what to do for the second one i think to to kind of solve that issue i'd say just try to be creative and be confident in yourself feel like you're not burdening professors who, who don't know you it's still their job to you know support the students that they're teaching and i think emily brought up a good point with just reach out to professors who you've been in a small class with that know you to at least some degree that can help you i reached out to my oral comm professor fws professors is also a genius idea um, and even though that might not be the, the strongest um, recommendation, it's still sufficient enough to get you into uh, the kind of running to be considered for an internship. Amazing, amazing. Yes, I second that, what you were saying about FWS. Um, so, sorry, next slide. I don't remember what the slides are, sorry. Um, 
So these are just um, when you get the PowerPoint, you'll be able to, we included a lot of opportunities here. Um, if you continue on the, to the next slide, you'll see some like um, platforms that have a bunch of opportunities by field. So don't be shy, check them out. Um, and then the next one, uh, these are just resources that you can look into if you're looking, if you're still looking for opportunities. Definitely make sure to check the deadline. They're going to be fairly soon, end of January, beginning of February, some even in March. So um, don't be discouraged if a lot of the deadlines have passed. There's still a lot of programs to apply to. Um, and then um, next slide, um, just more opportunities. The next slide as well. So you'll see a lot of this. Um, and we just wanted to finish up um, with an opportunity to answer your questions. You'll see a bunch of slides here. We can answer specific questions if you're interested, but um, it, we just want to have time for your questions. I just also, I, I just remembered this and I don't know if anyone had already touched on it, but it's back to the letters of rec and like when you should request one and for how much time. So typically, you know, one to two months in advance is fantastic. Um, and I, we all understand that, you know, deadlines are coming up very quickly. Um, so if you can, you know, think about people who have already written a letter for you in some way, either like gaining entry into college or, um, you know, where they can modify um, your letter, things like that would be very useful. Um, typically, uh, professors and PIs do sometimes, you know, they're not too happy with um, necessarily you asking five days before to write a letter. So, you know, with a February 1st deadline, for example, it might be better to sort of follow up with people. Like I, I could, if I oops, sorry, um, could think about, you know, applying to a February 1st deadline and I wanted a probably who have written it for me like multiple times, you know what I mean? Um, so, and like, I'm confident that those are people that have already written for me multiple times when I've requested in the past or asked about them um, to write one for me in the past. So, you know, it doesn't seem like as much of a burden or like that I'm gonna get on their bad side or anything. So try to think about that. Um, but we do understand, you know, also with the pandemic going on, there's, you know, there's a lot of delaying with certain deadlines. So don't be afraid to just search for your opportunities there. Um, you know, if you request uh, someone to write you a letter now when the deadline is February 15th, that's still a pretty good, you know, amount of time or like, you know, any time later than that, uh, I'm sure there are still research opportunities. It's just about you digging in and finding them. But we understand that this is kind of a difficult um, time and um, just trying to make the most of it. And a lot of opportunities are now transitioning to remote um, experiences. And so they're still planning them. So applications are being delayed by like one or two months. So definitely don't think that all the deadlines are, are up. So with that, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I know people have been trickling off um, just because we're, we were already at seven. Um, but thank you for coming. Um, you feel free to jump off the call, but we'll be here for any questions. Um, so feel free to unmute yourself or turn your video on or chat um, and we can definitely answer your questions. So thank you. Someone asked, will the Zoom recording of this event be available online? Um, yes, uh, it's just a matter of when it comes up. I don't know about Saknas, like when you guys are gonna upload, we will probably upload on our website, which is uh, cornellcurb.com um, or I think curb.cornell.edu as well. Um, and then we have a YouTube channel, just search up Cornell Undergraduate Research Board and it should be up and running in a week or two. Vic, can you send the, the website on the chat just so everyone has oh, it? Yes. yes, I need to make sure it's actually Cornell. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be sure to save the chat. I'm so unprofessional right now about that. Okay. So any questions, feel free to ask them anything at all and your net ids if you forgot for those who are still here follow us on insta <laughs> facebook anything thank you all for coming feel free to unmute yourself with questions or anything thank you guys
Hi. Um, Hello. Uh, I'm a sophomore transfer, and this is um, this past fall was my first semester at Cornell. Um, and so I actually have been at three different schools uh, in the past year and a half. Um, so I didn't really get the opportunity to like get into research yet. Um, and I also am trying to switch majors. So I feel like my uh, track record has been a bit of a mess. Um, so I was just wondering what, um, like how you guys think I should, I could go about um, finding a professor to research with um, when I'm not really in that department and I don't really have access to professors yet because I haven't taken any classes there. Are you referring to summer experiences or, or during the semester? Uh, either, but I'm, I'm looking for during the semester right now. I know that um, it might be a little bit late, but I'm just trying to get on top of it. What kind of research are you interested in, like the field? Um, so I'm, I'm going to be a biology major and I'm looking for um, microbiology or just general, yeah, pretty much okay. microbiology. So I can talk a little bit. So in my lab, I'm the lab leader in my lab and I help to interview the application, the applicants um, and kind of act as like a middleman before you actually talk with the PI. Um, mm -hmm. And I say for my lab, just the best time to reach out um, and I can really only speak for my lab, but it kind of goes the same for other labs. Um, it's best to reach out like either a couple weeks before the end of finals, so that doesn't really apply now, or um, a week or two before the beginning of the semester, because that's kind of when PIs are, are looking to, um, to interview people or add people in the lab now that they understand what the semester will look like. Um, and then I think, again, just kind of like being, even if you don't have prior research experience, um, just being open and like, again, reading the professor's publications and pointing it out like, oh, I was reading your publication on this website and I was really interested in false memory and eyewitness identification. Could I talk to you a little bit more? Just like showing curiosity um, in your emails when you reach out to professors. And they understand that you probably don't know anything about the publication or the research. As long as you're showing curiosity, that's important. Yeah, and I think, oh, sorry, Joanna, you go. I was also just gonna say too for um, like microbio specific, I don't do research in microbio, but I've often like looked through bio research opportunities and the bio website on like the research tab allows you to filter by professors um, by specialty. So you can kind of sort them through, typically I do like neurobio when I sort, but you could do microbio. Um, and then in the different like professors that come up, like just directly clicking on them, seeing if they have lab um, websites and then um, going from there is like a great way to find more information about people who you might be interested in. The way that they structure the opportunities to on the bio website is they typically say, um, have like a paragraph at the bottom of most professors or PIs um, bio sections of how many hours they typically expect to you, how many credits you would take, can you do it for pay and things like that, which is always like helpful to kind of include um, if you do reach out with them and like just to like know more information about what the opportunity is and the positions that they may have available. So that could be a great way to also start just like looking through different um, opportunities. But even if you're from a different field, I think definitely just like underlying your curiosity, like Phil was saying, um, and then also any maybe translatable skill sets or classes that you took um, that could highlight it. And if you haven't taken any classes, that's like also totally okay. Um, I'd say that passion is like the most important thing to convey, um, but yeah. Well, thank you. I've sent out a few emails. So I have, I have looked through there. It's just, um, there aren't a lot of microbiology PIs. So I've, I think I've emailed like half of them so far. Um, and I know that I should branch out. It's just, you know. Yeah. Also, sorry, I forgot to mention this too, but that reminds me because I, I know that there aren't that many microbio um, PIs, but check out the vet school as well if you haven't already, because they have a lot of work in, in like infectious disease and public health type stuff. Um, tends to use like animal models because of the vet school, but I find that like most places at Cornell use animal models anyways. Um, but yeah, that could be another great place to look for people doing um, more of like disease focused work um, or immunology type stuff. And also summer experiences would be great ways of 
getting to know a lot of what Cornell might not offer for students, um, like more on the human side or, you know, what, whatever it might be. Um, so definitely, yeah, as a way to like expand that and um, yeah. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. I was just, I, I'm just trying to, I haven't actually, I'm just trying to figure out how many, how many people that I might reach out to before I get like a response. Don't be or... discouraged. Don't be discouraged. It's not going to happen um, very quickly. Um, it's really not even about you. It's about yeah, no, people I... are very busy and this is a very, you know, uncertain time. And um, a lot of, just so you know, a lot of PIs at Cornell might not even be taking students for this next semester just because they can't really mentor students without being like you know in very close contact yeah. so um it's sort of an unusual semester in addition to that so please please don't get discouraged um it, keep going that's all i have to say <laughs> um, but there are also two other students here i want to make sure that they um don't have any other questions um after the panel um but yeah definitely feel free to email us if you have any additional questions happy to help